Okay. Hi, Jenna. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. It's nice to see you. Thank you so much for having me. So, you're an author, a fairly successful one, it looks like. You've got a lot of books. How many books do you have published at this point? So, three out, and then my fourth that I'm here talking about today will be out on September 27th, so tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow, okay, great. Well, good timing. Um, you've got one book that was turned into a Netflix movie, Love and Gelato, but I see on, on here that you've got Love and Gelato, Love and Luck, Love and Olives. Is that a series? Yes, that was a series, so three book series. Um, Spells for Lasting is, is my first book outside of this series. Okay, does Netflix plan on doing the whole three? Do you think so? Nothing is announced or you know permanent at this moment. Um, they did buy the rights to all three of them, but I don't have anything to announce at this point about the other ones being developed. So, how long has Love and Gelato the movie been out? So, Love and Gelato came out this summer, so it hasn't been terribly long, just a couple of months. Okay, I'm gonna guess they're gonna wait and see how it does before they decide if they want to do two and three. That's, Possibly. Um, yeah. The film actually did extremely well. It was number two in the world <laughs> for Netflix. Oh, wow. Um, okay. I know. It was kind of wild yeah. that first week that it came out, especially it was in the top 10 in the U.S. So I think it did do well. But I mean, you just kind of never know with these things. Well, congratulations for that. That's super. Thank you. Did you shop it around or did they just pick you up out of the out of the sky? So um, it was actually a director. So Brandon Camp is the one who directed and, and produced. Um, he was the one who was out shopping it around. So it actually sold to another place before it did for Netflix. Um, Netflix is where I'd always hoped that it would land. I feel like they've done a really good job with a lot of YA adaptations. So I was really happy when it ended up with Netflix. So just real quick, the story of Love and Gelato. Uh, I read the synopsis actually of the movie. Um, so this is kind of a romantic comedy? Yes, I will say that the film is very, very different from my book, which my readers were very quick to point out. Um, but yes, it is a contemporary romance. Um, my story is, um, I would say, a bit heavier than the film version. Um, there's a lot more elements talking about um, grief and a teenage girl kind of learning to move forward after losing her mother. Um, so they were, I mean, the, the film was a very different adaptation of the book, but I think that both really captured it, that it really captured the heart of the story. Well, it sounds fantastic. Congratulations again. And, uh, you know, maybe I'll check it out because uh, I haven't you. watched anything really wonderful on Netflix in a while. So yours might be the, the next one. Um, I did want to ask you, one thing about it, you said that the book and the film were very different. What? Give me one example of something that they, two questions, then ask, answer if uh, you think it got better or not, or did you prefer the book <laughs> version? <laughs> well, I am a hardcore reader and also the author of this book, so I think I'm always going to say I thought the book was better, <laughs> okay. whether it was mine or not. Um, so one thing that was very different right off the bat is my novel is set in Florence, Italy, and the setting is actually the American Cemetery of Florence. There is a cemetery there that is technically American land. Um, I actually went to high school in Florence, Italy, and I had a friend who grew up in that cemetery. Um, and I remember as a teenager thinking that would be such a great setting for a novel. So that was an idea I carried with me. Um, so the film is actually set in Rome. Um, and there's a moment when the characters go to Florence, which was really a neat experience for me because I was watching these characters that I'd created hang out in places I'd hung out in as a teenager. Um, but the setting was a very, very big part of the book. So having that changed right off the bat, my readers were like, what's going on here? <laughs> Did you have any control over the film? Or did you just? I no. I no. my decision was to turn it over completely to filmmakers. Um, books have always been the thing that I've wanted to work on the most, um, and I was at a point in my life where I knew I did not have the capacity to work much on a film, and so I decided to turn it over completely. Did you watch any of the shooting? I didn't. Oh, were you? Uh, they were also shooting during COVID, which complicated things. I oh. think they had a pretty closed set. Okay, all right. 
Well, again, congratulations for that, and I think I will check it out. I'll look for it. Uh, so your new book is called Spells for Lost Things, and I'm just going to read this real quick. Uh, in this brand new standalone novel, two teens try to find their place in the world after being unceremoniously dragged to Salem, Massachusetts for the summer. I had to laugh at that because I'm from New England. I'm from the Boston area originally. I haven't lived there oh, since I love that. 2005. I moved away to Las Vegas where I am now. But I love Salem. I think it's a wonderful place. And the way it says unceremoniously, it's like they didn't really want to go to Salem, Yes, right? well, they each have their own reasons for why they don't want to be there. But Salem is certainly not the problem. Salem is magical. I had the greatest time visiting it when I was getting ready to write this novel. Okay, so tell us just a little bit about this. Don't give it all away, but just give us a maybe a one or two minute synopsis. Sure. So this is a dual point of view story. We have two main characters. Um, Mason is 17 years old. He's been in foster care for many years. He's been in many different foster homes. And his main goal is to get back to his mother, who's been um, dealing with drug addiction for many years. Um, in the meantime, he has moved to a new foster home in Salem, Massachusetts. Um, there's something different about this home, though. The foster mother is someone who had a close relationship with his mother at an earlier point in their lives. So it's a very challenging environment for him. And his main goal is to get out of there and find his mom as fast as possible. He's lost all contact with her. And then our other character is Willow. Um, she is a young woman who is really caught between two families. Um, her parents have divorced. They've created you know, new families, new lives. And the only thing she has to look forward to in her mind is leaving everything behind and going to travel the world. Um, she really misses a sense of home and she thinks if I can just get out into the world, travel everywhere, everywhere, I'm going to find some place that feels like home to me. So she gets a big surprise when her mother, who she has a very distant relationship with, asks her to go to Salem, Massachusetts with her. Um, she learns that her mother has not been forthright about her past. Her mother actually grew up in Salem and has a twin sister who has recently passed away, who our character Willow had no idea about. So they are there to settle the estate. And while they're there, she learns that her family is full of <laughs> contemporary witches, basically women who are practicing witchcraft in Salem. And she and Mason collide. She learns that her family may be under the influence of a curse, and it turns into a bit of a mystery. Uh, well, Salem is synonymous with witches, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I tried hard to set it somewhere other than Salem, and the book really wanted to be set in Salem, so that's where I ended up. <laughs> I, I think it would confuse people if you put it somewhere else, yeah? Because right? Salem, which is okay, yeah, that, that goes right together. Yeah, I think Salem is so interesting because there were certainly no witches during the Salem witch trials, but now it's such a you know, gathering place for people who are practicing this kind of thing. Well, it's become almost a tourist uh, concept now because they all the signs, the street signs have the witch. And then even in the old show Bewitched, when they filmed there for three or four days, they changed all the street signs to use Elizabeth Montgomery's image instead of the old hag witch. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. I saw the big statue of Elizabeth Montgomery. Yeah, yeah. So she sort of put it on the map, really. Fascinating. Uh, be because in those days, they didn't have national television shows moving around the country so much. They were all done in Hollywood. So when they came, I remember I was a kid and it was real exciting. The, it was on the local news. They had interviews with Elizabeth Montgomery and uh, Dick Sargent every morning before they would shoot. And you know, it was a big deal. It was like a huge Hollywood show comes to little small town Salem. How interesting. So were the streets, you know, I had so much fun on Essex Street, were they lined with these kind of witchy occult shops or did that come later? Um, I don't remember too much of that, but uh, certainly the House of Seven Gables has been there forever. And that one hotel, I forget what it was called. They renamed it in the TV show, but that became very famous just because of the TV show. And then the Gordons of Gloucester statue of the fisherman, uh, that became very, you know, it was like all of a mm -hmm. sudden everybody was taking pictures of these places or getting their picture taken. 
before and we everyone had, was just walking past before <laughs> yeah and you know before we had the term selfie there was no such thing as that term but essentially it was selfies in those days except somebody else had to hold the camera <laughs> it's the only difference <laughs> Uh, okay, well, great. We've got just a couple minutes left. I want to just talk a little bit about you. So, have you been a writer your whole life? Is that what you've done yeah. for a living, or did absolutely you? My, yeah, yeah, absolutely my whole life. Of course, I've had other other jobs. It took till I was about twenty nine to publish my first novel. Um, but I was just thinking about it this morning that I have been writing as long as I possibly could have. I remember locking myself in my bedroom with a word count, I was going to write a certain number of pages. I think I was probably seven years old. <laughs> what was it then? You were just a bookworm kid as a, and that was it? Yes. You wanted to write? Books were just such a miracle to me. Like I, I couldn't even imagine why anyone was doing anything except read. Um, I enjoyed reading so much as a child and I read so voraciously. And then I remember at around age 11, I felt like I'd read everything in my children's library. And looking back, I probably had. <laughs> Um, and being excited to read the teenager books. And I'm, so I'm 36 now. And I remember like in the nineties going to my little local library and looking for the teenager books. And there was this little tiny shelf. Um, and I remember being so disappointed in both the quantity and also the topics that were addressed in those books. It seemed like all the books were about cheerleaders and I was not interested in that. So I actually told my mom at that age that that was the age that I was going to write for when I grew up. Um, I wanted to, I always wanted to write books for teenagers. So you had no interest in the computer then? I, I, rem I mean, yeah, it just wasn't that big of a deal to me then, I guess. Well, that's nice to hear. <laughs> because this was probably would have been just before everybody got a phone and stuck it to their face. And right, I had yeah. I had like a brick, you know, Nokia telephone in <laughs> high school. But yeah, I think I was uh, my husband and I were talking about that. We were kind of one of the last sort of generations or moments before we all had phones. The smartphone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, cuz a cell phone didn't do anything in those days except being a phone. Right. But but now, you know, they I don't even know why they call them smartphones. It should be just handheld computer because right. essentially it does the same thing as your laptop, only it's handheld instead of sitting on your on your desk. You know, goes with you everywhere, goes with you everywhere in your pocket, goes to bed with you. You know, unbelievable. <laughs> well, listen, we got to wind this down. Thanks so much for coming on. Uh, do you have a website that you want to give out? Yeah, I do have a website. It's jennaevanswelch.com. Um, I spend most of my time online on Instagram, though. That's if you want to find me, that's where I'll be on the internet. Okay, super. Well, best of luck. Congratulations again on uh, your Netflix, Love and Gelato. And Spells for Lost Things comes out tomorrow. And it'll be available, I assume, uh, Amazon and everywhere else, right? Yeah, anywhere that you buy books. Okay. Thank you again. It was nice meeting you. Best of luck. Thank you so much. It was so nice meeting you.